Welcome to Psychosynthesis Conversations, your channel for psychospiritual reflections and experiences. And now to introduce you to our topic for today, here is your host, Kenneth Sorensen. Today's guest is John Shutland. John is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and completed a master's degree in developmental psychology at Union Institute and University. He has been developing his work in psychosynthesis and the field of human potential over the past 20 years. John is a psychosynthesis trainer, therapist, writer, and educator. He is the founder of the Synthesis Northeast Training Institute, former president of the Synthesis Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, and currently serves as a senior instructor with the Psychospiritual Institute in Florida. John has provided extensive training for life coaches and corporate coaches across the U.S. and internationally. He has also been an instructor at Sophia University and American International College in their graduate psychology degree programs. He has contributed numerous articles to the AAP Psychosynthesis Journal and most recently authored a chapter in the book Willing to Love, Stories of the Couple's Journey as a Path of Transformation, published earlier this year. John is a nationally board-certified coach and psychosynthesis life coach, and he maintains a private coaching and therapy practice based in Brattleboro, Vermont, in the USA. I hope you will enjoy this conversation where we reflect on the nature of conflicts and what role the combative energies plays in these conflicts as they are related to the instinct of self-assertion. We also go into the transformative work of sublimation and transmutation to help us maturely express these energies. And lastly, please help us spread the word about psychosynthesis by liking and subscribing to this channel and please comment if you have any feedback. Without further ado, John Shutland. Hi, John, and welcome to Psychosynthesis Conversations. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to have you present here today. And uh, this is actually the first podcast that uh, I'm doing. So you're the first guest and I'm very happy for you to be here. And I I know you from uh, the Psychospiritual Institute in Florida, where you are a senior instructor. Uh, and I have always loved your, present, uh, your presence and how you express psychosynthesis. So before we go into the topic of today, perhaps you could, uh, could tell us a bit about your journey into psychosynthesis and why you choose to express yourself uh, within this psychological modality what's really motivating you mm. well ken first it's just an honor to be here so thanks for inviting me in and i want to send good wishes on the podcast thank you uh, both today and going forward mm. it's a great gift to the community um so my own journey i'll just say briefly was that i got into the field of psychology um, I was doing some work as a counselor with young people, and I didn't have a lot of training and background in psychology, and I enrolled in a psychosynthesis training program at the Concord Institute with Tom Yeomans and studied with Tom for a year, and then uh, was at the Synthesis Center with uh, Dee Dee Furman. Mm. And after two years of psychosynthesis training, I should really say after the first weekend, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that this was what I wanted to be doing, that this was going to help me explore the depths of, mm. of a human being, my own depths, that I'd be able to support other people in exploring the full range of human experience, mm. you know, both because psychosynthesis was, it was immediately apparent to me that psychosynthesis was both a depth psychology and a height psychology. Mm. And the combination of working on the psychological level of psychological uh, concerns and integration, as well as what we talk about in psychosynthesis, the spiritual dimension, the mm. higher realms, the 
what Maslow talked about the to the further reaches of human potential you exactly. know who we, and who we may be so that's what drew me in and I have been here ever since and it's 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 a both a field of study and a practice for a lifetime mm. yeah. Are there any particular uh, element of psychosynthesis that you really resonated with? You know, it's a very broad psychology, very integrative. Was there any particularly, um, you know, it, it points to different types of experiences, you know, it's very experience-based. Was there anything that in particular resonated with your being? Yeah, yeah, pretty much all of it. But what, but what I'll say in the beginning was that it gave me a certain confidence that I could turn towards my immediate circumstances mm. and whatever I was experiencing, and um, and by being present with my feelings, my emotions, my impulses, that um, that that experience of presence mm. would allow me to um, to grow just mm. by turning to and trusting my experience and whatever that was. Mm. Um, so that, that was a big piece starting with presence. Mm. And then um, early on uh, the work with subpersonalities was pretty powerful as well, because I realized that I was, uh, what do they say in psychosynthesis? Every person is a crowd. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it helped me realize you know, the experience of sometimes being inwardly conflicted or how we can become dominated by a certain aspect of our personality. Mm. So I think it gave me an experience of freedom mm. um, and confidence that I could sort of make great good friends with who I was mm. and that I could accept who I was mm. and invite other people into that same experience. And then, of course, from there, just learning about the will and um, the ideal model and all the other core experiences just added more and more to the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any spiritual practice before you took up psychosensis? Uh, like, do you come from a religious background? Or uh... Yeah, you know, I didn't grow up with any strong religious observance. Mm. Um, I grew up... Um, the, the first real spiritual practices that I really engaged with as an adult were meditation. Yeah. And I studied um, with Thich Nhat Hanh and went to many retreats with his um, Plum Village community and Sangha. Mm. And his, that experience of mindfulness was immediately, it's something I immediately recognized mm. in psychosynthesis. Yeah, so, exactly. This is very familiar. Mm. It was like a combination of psychology and um, spirituality that rested a lot on the on the mindfulness and the loving observer and exactly. taking good, taking good care of our inner world. Yeah, it sounds pretty much the same basic experience I had. I also came from a, you know from a lot of meditative background before I entered uh, psychosynthesis and. You know, just the joy of finding a psychology that puts at the very center, uh, you know, pure consciousness, myself as a center of pure consciousness, uh, is, is was such a, a, a crucial factor of why I choose uh, psychosynthesis, because uh, many other psychological modalities and psychotherapy don't have that insight that the core of our being is consciousness. Uh, so there was something that really drawed me into psychosynthesis from that point of view. So there seems to be, you know, you come from from the same type of, of background that we, it's like you discover uh, a part of reality and then you see that reality is all also present in, in psychosynthesis as a map of the personality and the spiritual elements. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, we. it does sound like we have very similar backgrounds in that way coming in. Mm. Um, yeah. And now you have chosen a topic to uh, go into today. There's something that uh, is really on, on your mind. And when I ask you what 
what uh, what you are mindful of today you took a topic about conflicts uh, conflicts in the world and aggression and why do we fight and why is there so much conflict and even hate hatred uh, in the world and uh, that's a pretty powerful topic to uh, to go into but uh, why did you pick that topic um <laughs> Well, I'll just I'll start by saying that I proposed the topic and then yeah. I, I feel like we chose it together or it yeah. chose it chose us. It's yeah. where I think you wrote back to me and said, it feels like that's where the juice is. Yeah. And it's because um, there because of what we are living with in our world and the concerns of our world right now and the challenges in our world mm the intensification of violence, the mm. situation in the Middle East, but it even goes back before that, the war in the Ukraine, um, the struggles in in this country, in the United States around racial justice and systemic mm. oppression. And, you know, uh, trying to understand some of these issues in the, cause there's so much suffering. Yeah, it's a, exactly. It feels like the topic is calling me as a response to the you know to what we see every day in the news yeah. and the images um and how can we what can we do you know the the issues can seem so much bigger than us yeah so i started to explore and read about um you know asa Jolie himself who developed psychosynthesis was was he would talk about the combative energies mm. within a human being and how mm. do we transmute and sublimate those combative energies he was always looking at how we can become dominated by any force in the psyche yeah and when we are identified or unconsciously identified with it so the more we can kind of take a deep look mm. at the forces within us within the human being that lead to these patterns and how we work how we how those combative energies uh move in us yeah. so that they so that they're not running amok so that they're not causing so much harm and damage if we learn to develop a more mature relationship to those forces and energies yeah. because clearly there since time began there have been combative energies exactly and i and i think that um if i should um uh bring a perspective into to many of the conflicts i think one of the most important elements for me is synthesis you know it, it psychosynthesis helps me not to get too attached to one of the polarities you know when there are conflicts in the world it's so easy to become attached to one of the polarities uh, it can be you know israel palestine you know that you are drawn to take the perspective of only one of them but this, uh, it's almost like a pledge to see things from a bit above and to understand the polarities involved in conflict and try to find, you know, a more detached uh, and a loving place without being caught up in the whole game of, of uh, perpetrator and, and uh, victim and oppressed and oppressor. And of course, without losing the perspective of justice, uh, because that's also a, a very important um, perspective to have on it. But I think psychosynthesis have this have this um, will to synthesis, which is a, a pledge to try to synthesize a fine solution that um, brings the needs of all the conflicts, all the conflicting partners uh, into a harmonious whole. And I know that's a, a, a big task, and uh, <laughs> but I think just to have that perspective, not to be too attached to any polarities. And this is, uh, this is also something that goes on within ourselves. You know, it's just, it's just as relevant that we are not taking sides um 
uh, from the first point, you know, when we have conflicting elements in ourselves, uh, also to be able to disidentify, you know, di the disidentification is in some way the first step uh, in order for us to, to get a more clear perspective of what, go, what, what is going on. Yes. And, um, yeah, and, you know, when aggression is um, arising or emerging in us and we start identifying with it, uh, we can be quite sure that we take often only one side of it. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, I'm I'm right in resonance with all that you've shared there. Bringing psychosynthesis as a frame to these conflicts and these challenges, I am finding just incredibly helpful and useful because psychosynthesis is essentially a framework and a process that helps us look at how the various elements or even conflicting elements mm. in any complex system can mm. grow more harmonious and more coherent mm. so those could be the complex elements within our own personality within our own mind the ways we become inwardly conflicted as well mm. as the outer elements to realize that in our world we are all part of a larger system mm. in which there are conflicting elements that's yeah. just a starting point what are we exactly. going to do when we live in a world where there are conflicting elements mm. and we have an aspiration towards greater harmony mm. and coherence as a human community. Yeah. I mean, that is just gotta be a question that is becoming, it's growing more and more urgent. I think mm. and people feel that everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, as a Jolie has a quote about, you know, before you can resolve problems, uh, in the social world, we have to have solved the, the problems or conflicts within ourselves in order for us not to, you know, just project our own unresolved issues upon the world. So, uh, yeah. and I think that's a call to each and every one of us. And I think there's no way out of, you know, really digging into one's own anger and the root of anger uh, yeah. And, you know, not be afraid of, of our anger, but, yeah. but, but explore it and make room for the anger. Because if we are not comfortable with anger, when we experience anger in our social relations or, or in the world, then we very often get hijacked by that energy. Yes, absolutely. And I've often in conversations even with, with other students in psychosynthesis or even with my clients have have tried to get across the point that anger is an is a natural arising emotion in our organism and that the problem isn't anger in our world it's poorly integrated anger yes exactly. it's anger that the person has there's no level of integration mm. there's a very beginning level of relationship to the anger mm. and i and i, and I want to talk talk about that a little bit in just a second but can i ask yeah. you one question first because yes. you talked about identification and disidentification because i find that the more work i do in psychosynthesis the more my identification grows to not just this small group of people not just my family not just my community, not just psychosynthesis people, but that really powerfully now, like when I look at the conflict in Israel, Palestine, and I grew up in a Jewish family. Mm. When I look at Israel, I have this, you know, it breaks my heart what's happening. And I have this feeling that these are my people. Yeah. And no less now when I see what's happening to the Palestinians, and this is not a thought, it's in my heart these are my people yeah you know these are yeah. my people too and then i can go for a walk in the state park and i'm walking amongst the pine trees and i feel like these are my people these are my yeah. pine tree people you know <laughs> just this larger and larger identification exactly. yeah and then all life starts to feel more precious yeah 
Exactly. Do you, and I, does, that, does that resonate at all? Or? Very, very much. Uh, and I think it, it lies uh, at the heart of psychosensus, as you know, uh, that we, we, we bring our awareness to that part of our being, the heart center, and that's this type of expanding identification uh, with, with the world soul, with humanity as an evolving entity. And this is also where, uh, as Ajoli speaks about the psychosynthesis of humanity, the psychosynthesis of each nation. And uh, what we see in Palestine, Israel, uh, they can call home. And the same, you know, thing with, with Israel, you know, also the impulse to protect their home uh, and, and their statehood. And then the struggle to find out where, where the borders are uh, in, in, in that uh, respect. But it's all part of, you know, uh, the psychosynthesis of humanity. Um, yes. Because the Palestinian people and the Israeli people are, are, are in some way beings in, in the totality of humanity. Uh, so seeing yes. it in this way, there's something that I hope there will come a synthesis out of this, out of this deep and long conflict. And I am, I am sure that at some point there will come a two-state solution uh, down the road. Um, but there's truly a lot of suffering going on, and yeah, and yeah. So let me thank you for that, and let me now I want to address the other question because mm. when I look at these conflicts. You know, if there are a lot of smart people working on how to work out the details so that yeah. people can live together in harmony and peace, the political, the geographical, I believe that people can do that. There's something in the way, though. There's an obstacle and it's psychological. We have a it's not just a political problem, a religious conflict. We have a there's a hatred problem. Exactly. There are steep psychological roots that make it very, very difficult for um, for resolutions to be agreed upon mm. and solutions to be agreed upon. So I I feel that there there is this strong need to get to take a look at the roots of anger, at mm. the roots of the combative energies, and learn how to work with them individually and in groups, so that yeah. our relationship to our anger and towards these, what Asajoli called the combative energies can yeah. be transformed. So can I say a few things about yes, that? Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, one of the things I appreciated about, about the way that Asajoli talked about the tr transformation of the combative energies is that he said that underneath these energies, what is driving them is the basic instinct or drive in every person to assert themselves. Mm. Every human being has a need to, to self towards self assertion, mm. to assert who we are in the world. And um, we have to assert our being. So mm. that's one side of the, what I'll say is the polarity is that, and it's a need we have to assert ourselves. Yeah. And then there are different ways that we go about our asserting ourselves. Some more primitive, more more um, unintegrated, more chaotic, sometimes more destructive. And then the that tendency to self assertion can mature over time. Mm -hmm. So you could say, on some level, a conflict, even a big conflict like Palestine and Israel. Each party carries a drive to, to a basic human drive and need to assert themselves and to and to exist, mm. to, to, to assert my very right to exist. That's the most exactly. basic level of self-assertion. Yeah. So think of it like this in terms of levels of integration and maturity. And I'd, I'd speak first to something like anger. So when a young child gets angry, and starts to throw things, a two-year-old is having a tantrum, let's say. They don't mm. want to put on their coat. No. They I start don't. throwing the coat. They start kicking and screaming. They are essentially, they're angry and they're saying, 
you know, somebody might say, why is that such a difficult child? <laughs> right? We can't control that child. They mm. won't do what we say. But the child essentially is saying, I don't like this. Mm. I don't like this. I don't want to put my coat on. Why are these adults making me put my coat on? And so they assert themselves, they're angry, and their behavior may be um, wild, it may be aggressive, it may be, they may throw things, they may bite someone. <laughs> mm. They're very upset, but they're lodging a protest, mm. actually. So we, would, we wouldn't expect in the beginning that a child would have fully integrated anger. No. Now, if somebody grows up and they become not two, but 32 or 42, and when they get angry, they still throw things and they break things and they bite people and they become aggressive, then their relationship to their anger hasn't matured over time. So what, what I think is important here is to, first of all, respect that there's something there that someone is trying to assert, the drive mm -hmm. towards self-assertion, and then the need to find more and more mature and effective ways to, to express that, mm -hmm. that, that piece, to assert ourselves in ways that are compelling, that are meaningful, um, and, that, uh, and that have some level of coherence to them. Mm -hmm in terms of how we express ourselves. So our relationship to who we are when we're angry changes over time. So we're not dominated by our anger mm. in a way that's destructive. Mm. So that's that's the first people that I first piece that I would lay out. And yeah. when and and I'll take you can I take it one more step? There? Yes. So how does the how does that happen? How does the integration happen? So I think back to when I started out doing working as a counselor in a um in an elementary school sometimes the kids would go out to the playground on recess and they would get angry and they would get into conflicts and and maybe one boy would hit another boy and, and then they get brought inside and they have to go see the counselor and talk about it hmm. and they would come in and tell me how you know that they that one boy had hit this other boy and i would say well why did you hit hit them and they'd say well i was angry I said, oh, you were angry. Okay. So why'd you hit them? And they said, well, I just told you I was angry. And I said, oh, I see. Okay. So I'm still, I don't understand why you hit them. And they're getting exasperated and they look mm -hmm. at me and they're frustrated. And then I'd say, you know, I get angry a couple of times a day or every week and I haven't hit anybody in years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you want to know how to, do you want to learn how to do that? Mm. So I said, feel angry, behave well, mm. feel angry, behave well. So when you get angry, what is the best possible expression of that anger mm. that you can think of? What's going to, what's your, what might be the, even a slightly better way of what you mm. could do when you're angry. Mm. And they said, well, maybe I could tell a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I could walk away. Mm. I said, good. And so that's the beginning of the person realizing that they can have a more mature response to their mm. anger and their combative energies. Mm. And that's just a small example. And then that grows over time. In yeah. Terms of how we relate to these things. So what's your, what's your response to all that? I think it's uh, beautifully expressed, and I think it's, uh, you know, to see anger as uh, a natural instinct. It's an instinct in us, you know, and uh, I remember that as a jolly proposed five fundamental instincts, uh, the instinct of self-preservation, and very often uh, the instinct of self-assertion that's related to anger is also uh, connected to self-preservation because we get angry when we are threatened, um, if our identity becomes threatened or or even if our life becomes threatened. And he also speaks about, you know, the sexual instinct, um, the hurt instinct and the instinct of curiosity. And they all related to different types of fear. And if we just focus into the self-assertion, it's the fear of not getting enough respect. Uh, it's uh, the fear of uh, 
uh, not being recognized as an individual. And of course, it also can be the fear of humiliation, you know, and that can bring the anger uh, forward. So to see it as something uh, that we need in order to yeah, cow our way, it's, it's one of the, the ego's um, um, powers that we can use to carve a way for us, you know, to struggle with life, because life is a struggle, you know, we have to educate ourselves, we have to socialize, we have to uh, earn our own money, you know, there's a lot of things in life that we, that we, we have to integrate into. And here the self assertion impulse is basically sound. But of course, uh, it can turn out to be quite destructive when uh, as you uh, and I have myself you know uh, struggled a lot with anger uh, from the very uh, beginning of my life uh, I was in a very you know working class environment and my dad and mom they were very strict and and oppressive you know so there was a lot of built up anger inside of me that were not allowed to 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 come out and um, I developed, you know, a, a big skin disease, acne, you know, related to this. And it was first when I started, you know, working with psychotherapy and, and, and uh, going into my, my anger related problems that my skin problems uh, faded away, but also that I started to relate to my anger and started investigate why I was so uh, angry and, and it has been a very, very complex journey because uh, I found find so many different subpersonalities in me that are angry, and some also archetypical. Uh, I have an inner Viking, you know, and the first time, you know, and I think it's related to the place where I live. You know, we pick Oops. up these, we pick up these uh, uh, old archetypes from way back. And um, I think the most important lesson that I've learned through psychosynthesis is really to, to start accepting also the very immature aspect of, the, uh, of my anger. It could be an impulse to kill or it could be an impulse to go berserk. So really yes. rage as a, as a psychological living energy. And I think if we if we can create a, a space within where we can be with that type of energy yeah. and, uh, you know, so it not come out in our knee jerk uh, reactions, then we have really created a, a good foundation for uh, for personality because we will not then uh, be so triggered when we when we come into conflicts. And of yes. course, this is a long journey to start relating to anger in this way. Yes, yes, absolutely. So let me, that's a great description of how the process that we have to engage in. And I want to introduce a concept that we, because we talk about synthesis and we talk about polarities yeah. in psychosynthesis. So if the tendency or the drive to assert oneself is a natural part of being human mm. to assert who we are, to say what we want, to speak up, to express our needs, to belong. We have to assert ourselves to have all these things, to follow mm. our dreams. You were trying to assert yourself in a strict environment as a child. Mm. And when you weren't able to satisfy that drive towards self-assertion, a natural response of anger, um, blossomed in you or yeah, naturally exactly. arose in you and then over time you work with that that mm. that tendency towards becoming angry so that when you become an adult if there's a moment where your drive to self-assertion may be temporarily interrupted or blocked you don't become enraged mm. the old pattern doesn't you don't become viking ken <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> So that's the process of spiritual maturity that as, yeah. as you become a more um, 
psychologically integrated and mature self, your relationship to that moment, you can deal with obstacles to self-assertion in a way other than rage or violence or, exactly. or throwing things, right? So that's the point. So, so there is this drive towards self-assertion. And then on the other side of the polarity, what I call, if, there, if assert is one side, accommodate is the other. Mm. Because assert is the yang, we assert ourselves. It has yang energy. It's necessary to assert who we are, you know? And then on the other side is the yin energy, which is also very important, which is to be able to accommodate yeah. that it's not all about what I have to say. How do we accommodate others? What is their point of view? How yeah. can we learn to yield at times as well as assert? So if you if you think about... I like to think about uh, the way people drive their cars as mm. a way to to practice with this. Some people are very assertive when they drive. Yeah. So when you, and they seem aggressive. So sometimes I'll be driving along and a big truck comes driving up within five feet behind me or three feet and I get out of my way. And I could sit there and get, I could do, I might get angry. Yeah, Why is this person <laughs> being so difficult? And then after I read Asa Jolie, I realized, oh, this is just, uh, this is just a, a, not a very well integrated uh, moment of self-assertion. This person mm -hmm. does not want to accommodate me in any way. They're not going to give me a moment to get over into the other lane. So it's, you can start to see in all the forms of aggression, somebody just asserting themselves, mm -hmm. but there's a distortion uh, the person's the person's level of assertion is so intensified mm. that there's no accommodation there. Mm. And so people who become overly uh, developed, if that faculty is, is over-energized, a person can become self-absorbed, get out of my way, they're overbearing. Uh, you know, a narcissist would be somebody who has a lot of self-assertion, but very little accommodation. Mm. They don't accommodate others. And then some people are very, they've developed the accommodation side and they know how to accommodate others, but they might not assert themselves. Mm. They can make plenty of room for everyone else to speak, but it's harder for them to speak up. Yeah, it could be a if, people, people pleaser. A people pleaser. And so the person who has accommodation is able to connect with others, to accommodate, to allow them, they, they create a space in which others feel that they really belong but mm. that person in the distortion of the accommodate is passivity mm. or even enabling situations to go on that really aren't working for them because they continue to accommodate and accommodate so sometimes people who are narcissistic or self-absorbed attract people who are accommodators mm. and it just allows that conflict to continue exactly yes and and so, and then I thought, well, what's the synthesis? So if you think one more, one more example about driving, if you come up to an intersection and I was discussing this with my wife, cause I'm, I tend to be an accommodator. So mm. I get to the intersection I let everybody go maybe, you know, and then I might get into the intersection and I'm going very slowly, you know, just through the intersection and my wife, she gets to the intersection. She waits for her turn, but then she gets in and she gets out. Like mm. she just, she just asserts her, t it's her turn and she goes. And I realized that even think, if you think you're accommodating everyone, mm. you're not really helping the flow. If everybody's uh -huh. at a four way stop and nobody goes, then you've got a problem. Yeah, exactly. But if everybody goes, you've got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we need the synthesis of assert and accommodate. Mm. And I think when you have both, you have harmonious flow. Mm. I, 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 I really, it's reminded me also, you know, I'm also into astrology, you know, and it's the polarity between Mars and Venus. Uh, it's uh, two other, you know, archetypes that uh, tells the exact same story about how, how important it is to, you should be in connection with both uh, energies um, but I think uh, in order really to in order really to be able to to move that aggressive energy from its immature state to its more uh, mature state, um, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing process because um, 
we can have so many um, layers within our psyche, uh, within our subconscious that we are not aware of until uh, situations um, uh, you know, trigger it, or perhaps we get uh, more influence in the world and are attracting more conflicts, and this trigger uh, this aggression. So I think uh, this is the learning from my own um, life that it's so important to recognize our own ability to wreak havoc in the world, uh, to be destructive. And very often yes. we can be destructive in a almost in in a covert way, you know, uh, we can have a nice persona, but below it, we there's there can be an impulse to destroy another one's argument or destroy another one's uh, perception. And I think, you know, that the first step must be that we have some kind of a deep acceptance of how deep this is rooted in us. You know, we, it's, it's, only, uh, it's only 80 years ago since, you know, millions of people were slaughtered on the European uh, ground, you know, in World War II. And I think these brutal energies, these uh, uh, instinct uh, of violence uh, run so deep in us. And it's only a very, very thin um layer that covers it and and i think that the more people who who are able to dig into these deep layers of unresolved anger and destruction um the more we can uh, facilitate that evolution of that energy because i think that that this type of anger is a resource for perhaps courage, uh, perhaps uh, mor moral courage, you know, the ability to stand your ground in, uh, in different areas of life. Yes, yes. That anger is a sign or a signal that we have some sort of paramount objection to something that's happening. Yeah. If we don't become angry in the face of atrocities, if we're passive, nothing would ever change. So the anger is an appropriate response. Mm. The violence may not be. No, exactly. The anger is an appropriate response. The frustration, even mm. the hatred is understandable. Mm. You may hate somebody. Now what? Mm. Be a living example, as Joel used to say. Mm. When you hate somebody, be a living example of somebody who can deal with their hatred and not make the problem worse. Yeah. And how are you, and, and that's very, very challenging. Of course. And how would you deal with, how will you deal with hate? Uh, and you know, these really deep seated uh, emotions, yeah. what, what, what's, what's the best yeah. techniques, you know, or. Yeah. Attitudes? So when, yep. And so when people are really caught, in those kinds of deep-seated anger, resentment, grievances, frustrations, and even hatred, there's usually a lot of trauma that's informing that, past trauma, and it's very, very hard for those people to hold their conflict and to hold the energies. So it's helping me realize, just like if a, if a couple, if I do couples counseling and they come in, they need help. They can't really, they're having a very hard time transcending their resentments, mm. their, their anger, their frustration with each other. So they're having, they need an external, what we say in psychosynthesis, an external unifying center, someone yeah. who can try to hold the intensity of their conflict in the best way possible. Yeah. And it's the same. So if we think that, for instance, in a global conflict, that that Palestine, the Palestinians and Israelis can work it out themselves. There's too much trauma. Exactly. There's, there's, it's too deep. They need this needs a holding environment of the global yeah. community, and I think yeah. that's what's happening now. It's been brought to everyone's attention. This conflict is our conflict as yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. we have to be able to provide an environment in which two traumatized entities you know, can be, can come together. Mm. And 
uh, you know, the two questions I wrote down around assert and accommodate one, the one question is I can sit with this question, how to assert your right to exist without dominating mm -hmm. or violating others. That's the, that's the question around assertion. Yeah. How to assert your right to exist without dominating or violating mm -hmm. others. And then on the accommodation side, how to accommodate others while still making your presence and your needs felt. Mm. So to hold these kinds of questions, but, but with two, when, you know, it, those aren't questions you can easily sit with when you feel like people want to hurt you. Exactly. And I, I, I think, you know, sometimes people will feel that they are dominated by us, even though we don't have any intention about it because if we are very identified with our solution to a conflict uh, then it's um, you know it's very hard to uh, to accept another perspective on the situation but as you say that um, and there's also the question there's also the question of justice you know, how to bring justice into, because we, we get very, very upset if we experience something that that we think is an, in, an injustice. Yes, yes. So, and, and very often, you know, in these types of conflict, this type of, of justice, there has to be brought some pressure on. I would almost say sometimes we, we have to really push people into into an agreement yes because there is so much built up anger and it's uh yeah it's very hard to 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 manage it without an outside pressure that's right that's right and you can again trace these these drives for justice all the way back that has been present all the way back to when people are little kids and the little yeah. kids again come in with their grievance and their protests and they say this isn't fair mm. what's happening isn't fair yeah and because they want fairness they want balance they want to be able to assert themselves they want to be whatever it is and so people are searching for fair solutions to mm. be fair mm. to feel like they're getting a fair deal but if the relationships if there's not the maturity there they can't really, um, they can't access uh, or accommodate the other side. And mm. so it's very hard to reach a fair deal. So that's yeah. why the, the presence and the pressures of the of the communities are so important. I don't want to get too far into the politics of it all. Mm. Um, but the these patterns and these and these ways of working with these basic drives and the and the combative energies, and I think. You can, I'd be interested, I know we don't have a ton of time here today and we could maybe talk more another day, but we could also do a little exercise mm -hmm. and look at how we, how we work with these energies because we have to learn how to work with our own combative energies too. Exactly, yeah. Those own tendencies. And then we, we come back to the suggestion from, from Asajoli that we first learn to deal with the conflict within ourselves before we go out in the world and try to solve other people's uh, conflicts. Because when we have resolved them or at least started to take a look of the conflicting forces within ourselves and have learned the basic techniques to deal with them, then we will not be caught up in, in, in the dramas of the outside world. But that's that's really a tall order, you know, to, to do that homework. So yes. that's, that's your, that's your psycho spiritual homework <laughs> <laughs> for each exactly. person. And Ken, you're so good with this because you put at the center of your work. Often when I see you uh, doing a session, uh, an observation session with a student, you, you, you center your work around developing the, uh, the depth of the loving observer, the ability yeah to sit as a loving observer with your experience, whatever it is, yeah. whether that's a uh, deep love for another person or whether it's rage yeah, or whether it's frustration to be the loving observer, to build a loving observer within yourself. Yeah. 
as a way to transform and sublimate those energies yeah and and i think that's that's it's it's a balance between you know love you know be able to hold and bear the pain of a conflict you know it's very often because we cannot bear the pain we cannot hold that intensity yes. uh, and when we cannot hold that intensity of uh, pain then anger come as as the solution to uh, to bring that pain away from me but the but when we settle into this place within where we are the loving observer we gradually um, develop that capacity to be with that pain and it's not only love it's also the will to love the mm. will to not act out of this pain but come from a deeper more mature part of oneself yes yes and you're actually pointing at something else here that asa joy talked about which is the goodwill and the need to have an abundance of goodwill <laughs> yeah. to do this work yeah when we're so angry or when we're so frustrated and this is very important what you're saying here because the the tendency is the first step a person might have is to try to not feel what they're feeling. How can right. I stop feeling so angry? How can I just, why can't I let go of my resentment? Mm. And so there's a repression yes. and then it's just bubbling underneath. So the point isn't to repress any of it, Absolutely but to not. take care of it, be the loving observer. Yeah. If I can hold both my resentment and my desire to be in harmony with this person mm. how do i deal with the tension there mm. of my of not wanting to see the person just through the lens of my pain mm. and my resentment but if mm. i try to repress that resentment it's not going to work no. so i have to i have to be with my resentment and still find a way to be with this person yeah. that feels harmonious could you present a, a short exercise for the listener of this uh, podcast uh, and me and so we can have a first step to look at our anger yeah and probably uh, hopefully resolve it hang on just one second I don't know if you heard that alarm, but that was our, there was a, there was an alarm going off, which is perfect for this exercise. Okay. It was a smoke alarm in the building, but it's now off okay. because just take a moment, notice how there are times in our lives where we become alarmed an alarm goes off within us. Wow. That was, settle, a synchronicity. was a synchronicity. So settle into the space. Both you, Ken, and anyone who may be watching or listening to this. And just move into your own inner world. And we'll do a, sh a short guided meditation here. Connecting with the rhythm of your breath. And being in an experience of presence. And what we will do is look at how we may work with this alarm, this inner sense of alarm, and introduce an experience of working with integration and elevation in our psyche. So I would invite you to consider a situation in your, in your life where you experience some anger or an aggressive impulse, perhaps a frustration. Just let it come to you, whatever it is. It could be very small. One forgot to put the milk in the, back in the refrigerator. <laughs> or it could be something very big, a way in which you feel you have a strong grievance against someone who has done you wrong. And bring this situation present. Visualize the person or people involved, what the circumstance is. And spend a few moments noticing 
your own internal reactions and energies. Be aware of any feelings of anger, fear, frustration, or even in the extreme hatred that may arise. Just let whatever is there register without pushing it away. And also see if you can connect now with any need that you may have in this moment. What is giving rise to these feelings? Is there some way in which you are trying to assert yourself or assert some part of your being or feel frustrated in that self-assertion? This is the work of integrating the combative energy, any form of a combative energy. Allowing it to be there, seeing your own needs. And next, in the face of these feelings, these energies now, imagine that your relationship to the aggressive impulse is being transformed. That somehow your aggression is turned over to the deepest part of you, the self, so that you connect with a higher calling and a greater good that springs from the core of your being. And recognize for a moment that you could respond to your combative energies, your aggression in a hostile way, in a hurtful way to others or to yourself or both. And that you can also elevate how you respond. If you turn the conflict over to your own soul. From this perspective, what is the most elevated or a more elevated and soulful response to your circumstances? And then hold both for a moment, both the more hostile reaction in the face of your discomfort and a more soulful response to those same circumstances. And realize the power of your own choice in this moment in how you respond. Not an unrealistic response. We're not going to all sit down and sing Kumbaya together, maybe. But what is that mature, that process of spiritual maturity as it moves within you that brings you to a soulful place in relationship to the intensity of your own feelings and energies? 
as you integrate them and elevate your response. And then finally, notice too that as you do this, your own energy may start to shift. And notice what kind of energy you may now radiate. Having arrived at this place. And just take a couple of more relaxed, easy breaths. Notice any tension that may have come from sitting with this difficult experience and bringing it into the light of your own awareness. And appreciate yourself for doing so and honoring the process that is alive within you of moving towards more integration, more maturity, more love, and more harmonious flow in life. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes, maybe wiggle your fingers, and enter back into the space. And this may, this may give us a chance to just kind of move towards the close of this conversation with just a little personal reflection, Ken. I'd love to hear kind of how that little exercise moved in you as you continue on your own journey of transformation. Well, I think it was a very interesting. Um, I choose... Uh, a situation where I have some kind of internal conflict with another person, you know, with different opinions. And um, a part of me feel, felt dominated by his opinion. And in some way, I think I was brought back to my, my, my childhood where I was not allowed to express my opinion. And I felt that my aggression was rising and there was an impulse to, to fight with him uh, as, you know, as a, a, a solution to if I just can remove him, then I can breathe freely. Uh, and then you shifted perspective, you know, um, coming from a more mature place I immediately saw that uh, there was another way and I could just forget about this other person and then concentrate on building my own opinion and expressing it. Not in opposition to him, but with the, just with the motive of building my own truth. And... Uh, in that way, it felt like I served both the need of the part of me that in some way choose a victim position, but, it, it, but that victim part was more empowered because it was allowed to express its opinion. Not so much in opposition to the other guy, but just uh, building my own a reservoir of thought and expresses it in any way I like. And it was very, um, there was a relaxation in my solar plexus when that solution came during this uh, meditation. Mm. You know, instead of being a fighter, then I'm a constructive builder. And that's a totally different energy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful example of how you transmute and sublimate the combative energy in that mm. moment. Mm. Because the combative energy, in a way, was presenting an obstacle to full expression of your own self-assertion and your own position. Yeah. Because it was in opposition to someone. Mm. And so by 
transforming your relationship there, you can see the su the sub sublimation, sublime meaning reaching a higher level even mm. of your own expression because mm. you're not just trying to out argue another position. Mm. Your focus now is reaching the highest level, sublimating, reaching for the sublime statement that is within you that you want to share. Mm. Exactly. That's and beautiful. still and still using that competitive energy, but just in another way. So the energy is still uh, valuable. Uh, yes. It, it, it's pure energy. Yes, yes, yes. It's the energy of asserting yourself. Exactly. It's the energy that you felt that could have been gone into a fight with this person, picking a mm. fight with their position. Mm. And you transmuted that energy mm. to assert in it, to use the energy of asserting yourself in an ele and elevating in that way. And actually, I'm now reminded uh, that as it always somewhere speaks about that the assertion of the ego can be transmuted and elevated into the assertion of the soul. Oh, that's so lovely. That's really <laughs> lovely. So assertion is okay. Yes. It's just a, a, a yes. an gradual lifting of the motivation. Yes. Yes. And then you, when you assert your soul, then you're connected to the force, your own life force. Mm. And you're asserting your soul. You're mm. bringing that life force into the world. Mm, exactly. Yeah the power and the beauty and the, whatever you have to contribute. And then humanity benefits for every person yeah. who, who transmute, who, who transmutes that energy, self-assertion from mm. their ego, picking mm. a fight to their soul, their yeah. truth, the truth and beauty, you know, and the beauty. Yeah. That's really well, lovely. Yeah. You know, I was going to sort of offer, there's an old saying in the Jewish tradition that, that sort of sums this up for me. Can I share it? Yes, uh, definitely. It's very short. It says, it's it's about assertion and accommodation and choosing, you know. Mm. It says, if I am not for myself, who will be? Mm. If I am only for myself, what am I? Mm. And if not now, when? Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you, John. Um, are there any way where people can read more about you, uh, learn about your work? Uh, is there anything, any way we can guide you, guide people so they can? I know you have uh, written an article, and uh, I will publish that article. It's called Integrate, Elevate, and Radiate. And it's a really a profound, good article that um, I would say uh, shed light on some of the core principles of the development theory of psychosynthesis. So I'm really very happy to to be able to share that with with my listeners and, and newsletters receivers. So. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And if that's up on your website and you have contact information, people can reach out. Um, and also in the last year, I was part of a group of people who put together um, a book called Willing to Love, yes. which looks at the challenges in relationships. It's it's the couple the couple's journey as a path of transformation. Mm. So it speaks to some of these same themes in the life of the couple, how do couples transmute and sublimate their own mm. energies so that they can both assert themselves in the relationship and accommodate the other. So it's a very great little crucible in which to look at these same principles within a relationship. And yeah. I wrote uh, the opening chapter in that book it sort of speaks to how the principles of psychosynthesis can inform the life of the couple. And mm. it and it addresses some of these same themes. It's called willing, yeah. to love, willing to love. And where can I get it? Uh, is it That's available? You can, yeah, you can get it online through bookshop.org or Amazon. Yes, the, the usual suspects will have yes. it. Yes, or you can order it through your local bookstore if you want to yeah. support the community. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much, John. And I will looking forward to have a. a 
conversation with you in in the future. I think we have so much to uh, dive into here. But uh, for now, I'm very grateful that you contributed in this way and helped to shed light on such an important topic as uh, how to resolve uh, conflict uh, within ourselves and in the world. Great. Well, I always enjoy connecting with you, Ken, and being in conversation. So I'll look forward to to more down the road. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you for listening to Psychosynthesis Conversations. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and help us to spread the wisdom.